Našim dnešným hostom je Kristof Zelinsky, profesor onkológie a medicínsky šéf Wiener Privat Klinik. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Professor, uh, many people know that smoking can lead to lung cancer, but the companies are trying to sell us some electronic cigarettes like Icos and so on. What's the difference? Are the people who are smoking this sort of safe from lung cancer? No, they are not. We know that uh, these uh, electronic cigarettes are as dangerous as non or the normal cigarettes, of course, uh, because there's a lot of other other f uh, parts in the fume which uh, are again causing lung cancer. So, you know, tobacco smoking has been uh, a story of uh, terrible uh, misjudgments where people were led by tobacco companies. And this goes back to the 50s, in fact, uh, when the first results were discovered that tobacco smoking is uh, leading to a series of diseases, not only lung cancer, but also uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, etc. And tobacco companies then started to make uh, scientific rounds where truly scientists were sitting there and were trying to prove that this is wrong, that smoking leads to diseases. There were a lot of uh, really bad misinformation campaigns, um, on, and it's been very well known. And in fact, up to the 60s and 70s, the Surgeon General of the United States has proved it again and again, shown that smoking cigarettes leads to terrible consequences. Um, but still, you know, we have a lot of problems, like for instance, young people smoking, Uh, very young people are really lured into smoking, and we know that the prevention campaigns should start at a very young age, at a very young age, with 10 years old, uh, because that is where tobacco companies are moving into right now. So this is a terrible story, in fact, of, 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 of really ruining people, uh, although it is known that these people are truly harmed. So... Uh Well, so it seems that the marketing of the tobacco companies always has the edge over or still has the edge over uh, prevention campaigns and so on. But like, so let me let me just be clear. If ICOS or regular cigarette is the same. Right. It is uh, both are known to be carcinogenic. Okay. Uh, if a person smokes, let's say from age of 18, when it's legal, smokes uh, one package a day, how, how many of these people will will get lung cancer? Well, it's, uh, the question is uh, the other way around, in fact. The question is cardiovascular diseases or lung cancer. Okay. Or what we know now, 90% of all cancers are, are associated with smoking. Bladder cancer is, kidney cancer is, uh, even pancreatic cancer is. So um, there's a lot of different diseases which are caused by this uh, terrible habit. and um, everybody is free to judge, of course. Where people are not free to judge is passive smoking. There, people are not making an informed decision because they think as they are, that they are non-smokers, that this, that this does, would not harm them. But passive smoking is also a major problem. So not smoking yourself, but just living with someone or sitting in an office with someone who's smoking. This is truly harmful behavior. Is it even worse than smoking yourself? Because like with a cig when a, a smoking a cigarette, like you have a filter, right? So uh, some of the bad chemicals like get filtered there. But if you're just uh, sitting somewhere, you, you have no filter between the cigarette and you. Uh, well, the filters don't help. It is just a story. Uh, okay. Yeah, just a story. Um, but uh, so you're both harmed, in fact. Both are harmed. In fact, I, it's very, uh, very interesting. I mean, I cannot say funny, but an interesting story where, you know, in Vienna, we have these hiring, which are places where wine is being drunk uh, in uh, one of the uh, outskirts of Vienna, which is called Grinzing. And I was once treating a uh, family of uh, wine growers who were smoking heavily. And it started out with him having lung cancer. Then she had lung cancer. And in the end, the dog they had got lung cancer. So you can imagine uh, what kind of sort of epidemic this re really is. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what should be, because we know that lung cancer is the lead 
cause of death regarding cancer right. in all the world. Right. Um, what should be what should the people notice about themselves about themselves? Like when when should they seek a doctor to check if if they have this kind of problem? Well, that is a major, major uh, and very important question. It is important because first of all, you can do something which is non-smoking. This is an informed decision, right? There's a decision that you should uh, take uh, by yourself. Now, of course, we know from there was a study called the Nelson study. We know that low dose computerized tomography in heavy smokers can detect lung cancer early um, and thereby prolong uh, survival. Uh, the story truly is that the danger which is involved in that is that people think they are safe when they smoke as much as they want when the lung cancer is being detected early. So that is really the problem. So you should not start it at all, in fact. Um, in fact, um, lung cancers are medically, and regarding treatment, are a success story of the last couple of years because we now start to see patients surviving five years or more, for instance, with immunotherapy, which is an important, a very important step. I mean, immunotherapy has uh, been awarded with the Nobel Prize 2018, which was given to two scientists who have developed that. And um, so for the first time, we're seeing truly long-term survival in selected patients, of course. Um, and we have also learned that lung cancer is a disease uh, which is being divided by molecular changes or non-molecular changes, or not, but not only histology. So we have realized, in fact, that lung cancer is a, an abundance of diseases which are located in the lung, but which are completely different biologically. So this should not give you the security that you should smoke and continue to smoke nicely and heavily, et cetera, and, and, and internally. But uh, from the medical point of view, it is interesting, and this is a paradigm to show what advances in medicine can achieve. Okay, but what can you notice first when having this? Well, like this is difficult to say, but uh, usually there's two, um, there's two, classical, two classical signs. One is, of course, coughing. Uh, without any uh, explanation. For how long? Because like you see now is the time of the year when many people are oh, coughing. Well, we usually say longer than six weeks uh, because usually you, you cough like for three or maybe six weeks. Um, and then it's, uh, it's uh, blood in your sputum. Okay. But only, frankly, don't take me wrong when I say that, but only when you're kind of sort of lucky because, of course, when there's no access of the tumor to a blood vessel and no access of the tumor to a bronchus, then you cannot sort of have this early early sign of a uh, of a disease. Very often, it is a late sign of the disease. As I said earlier, you're a medical director of Wiener Privatklinik. Uh, are you specializing more on the foreign patients or domestic ones? Well, we have a mixture. We have a mixture where we have. Uh, um, many, of course, domestic patients, uh, but we do have certain specialities where we are catering very much to foreign patients. Now, oncology is a classical example where we cater to foreign patients as well, or partly even more to foreign patients than to domestic patients, because in very many countries uh, surrounding Austria, medical services are not as sophisticated as we do have it in in uh, in Austria or Germany or France or whatever, so that is why we very often have uh, and, and and Vienna is very often the first stop when you would go from somewhere central southeastern Europe, central Europe, etc. So it's the first stop in the West, uh, and therefore we do see a lot of patients who are coming uh, from uh, to us from uh, an abundance of countries. Very many patients we're, uh, we're seeing from Romania, we're seeing many patients from uh, um, Croatia, Serbia, uh, Macedonia, we do see a lot of patients uh, from. Uh, we used to see a lot of patients from the Ukraine and, and, and Russia, of course, this has changed. Um, and we are also seeing patients from Slovakia. Okay. Uh when regarding Slovakia, also the other countries, and regarding your, your field, which is oncology, what sort of uh, 
diagnostic methods do you use that the people cannot get at home? Well, we are proud that we can cater to patients by delivering to them the most sophisticated methods of diagnostics similar to an academic institution. So I was professor for a long time and, and, and chairman of uh, the uh, oncological department of the Medical University of Vienna. And therefore, I know what an academic institution can uh, really achieve. So our idea always was to do very similar or analogous interventions which are being done in the university hospital. This starts, of course, with all kinds of radiologic uh, interventions like a PET CT or a fine needle biopsies, which are extremely important um, in our, in our uh, diagnostic methods. We are having an um, we are having a uh, ultrasound guided uh, possibility to uh, make bio uh, make biopsies from uh, lymph nodes or bronchi or whatever. So it's called ABUS. Um, we do have a lot of different bio uh, biopsy methods, and what is important, subsequently histological analyses, which not only include the histological diagnosis as such, but very importantly, so molecular diagnostics. Why are molecular diagnostics so important? Uh, you have to uh, be aware that uh, ever since the year 2010, more than 100 drugs have been registered by the European Medicines Agency, which are targeting molecular changes in tumors. So we are having uh, today the possibility built upon the insights from the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, we have the possibility to truly target uh, certain molecular changes which keep the tumors growing, proliferating, and spreading over the body. And therefore, molecular analysis is extremely important. We call this next-generation sequencing. So we offer this on tumor specimens as well. Um, and that is something which, which sets us apart from very many other private institutions, um, even in, in other parts of Western Europe. Of course, we do have... Not, this is clear. We do have a very luxurious and nice environment, so patients feel very much at home and very much uh, looked after. But medically, which I, which I most important, uh, most importantly, um, are responsible for, is um, that we do have methods which are comparable to academic standards. Because uh, one might think that uh, usually you get the best kind of treatment in university hospital, right? It's AKH, Allgemeines Krankenhaus, where right. you've worked uh, most of your life. Um, and this, the pri private clinics are mostly like for earning money and this kind of stuff. Uh, what, what would you say? Is, is, isn't a patient better off going to Allgemeines Krankenhaus, which is, which is so near your right. private right. clinic? Well, this is a very good question and it's very easily answered. Uh, there are, of course, interventions which we would never dare to do in a private hospital like for instance, cardiac, uh, major cardiac interventions, uh, bypasses, et cetera. Uh, once we are able, and you have to be aware of the fact that uh, medicine has developed in a very important way, that there are a lot of minimal invasive methods in the meantime. So once you're minimally invasive, we can very easily do this uh, in, 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 in a private hospital without putting a, a patient into any hazards or problems or dangers. Now, of course, one thing has to be said, that we are very, very careful to be ethically correct. And this means that we are, of course, not the last resort for patients who have no other choice. Uh, we are very often uh, able to make other recommendations in patients who are still fit and patients who can travel. But palliative care is not a thing where you should really take people from one part of Europe to the other just to um, spend them the last couple of days in a hospital plus spend a lot of money on that. So I think that this has all to be taken into account and we have to be not only medically correct, but we also have to be ethically and morally correct. And I think, and I believe that that is what we are. So from your words, I can see that maybe it's, it's more about diagnosis in, 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 um, in your clinic and uh, maybe setting up or advising people what to do next when they, they still have time and still have the strength. And well, they could do it faster than if they went, even Austrians who could go 
to regular hospital, but with you it can go faster? Or? Well, it is not. We are, we are truly treating patients a lot. Uh, we have 140 beds. We have an outpatient clinic, which is uh, also very frequent, uh, very much frequented. And very often patients come in and fly in in the morning, go to the day clinic, have an outpatient treatment, get their chemotherapies or treatments or antibody treatments or whatever they uh, they are recommended to get from from their the cancer uh, the the cancer specialist for instance, and then they fly out in the evening. So it very much depends what the patient wants. Um, very frequently, we are confronted with such problems that patients do not trust their systems they have at home. Um, in fact, uh, there was even one patient I have um, I have encountered who was uh, who wanted to watch the nurse putting the antibody into the saline solution, which he then received because at, in his home country he had the experience that this was not done and that he was only receiving the saline solution IV placebo uh, placebo right um, so that is how far mistrust sometimes goes. And of course, um, we would never would never uh, be uh, even thinking of this acting in in, in 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 such a way or a similar way. So it's um, I think it's very much the choice choice of the patient, um, and also the choice of the patient into a, a sort of uh, qualification of the treating physician. And you have to be aware that we are very very much centered on evidence based medicine. Evidence-based medicine means that there are trials, there's clinical studies which are being reported. Meta-analysis. Uh, Meta-analysis. Uh, and if there's two or three phase, one, uh, phase three studies, uh, we teach ex exactly the outcome of these very important uh, studies. Um, we have the impression that in some neighboring countries, people are not that much relying on evidence-based medicine, but rather on eminence-based medicine. So uh, the that, prof what that the, the professor, professor says. says, right? What the professor says. Well, it's often very nice. I'm a professor myself, so I'm very flattered to to to, to, to think about that. But I would never allow myself to be just an eminence. I still believe that, for instance, I'm an oncologist. That the best oncologist is not is, is the one who is who looks nicest. But it's the one who has read most uh, and who has uh, the most of information also about ongoing trials, about developments uh, which, uh, which, which happen, and also your international connections, because this guarantees that you are having some kind of um, insights which other people might not have. Oh, yeah, because in evidence based medicine, the expert opinion, which could be you, for right. example, is on the lowest level. Right. 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 And the met meta analysis, right. which is like a sum of more studies, that's that on, the, on the top level. But yeah, I know that. And also in Slovakia, like sometimes they treat the patients not by the way of medicine, but because we're used to doing it this way. Yeah, you right. Know? Uh, what do you think, by the way, of Slovak healthcare system? Uh, well, I don't know the Slovak healthcare system uh, too well. I only know the patients from Slovakia who are coming what to us. What did they say? Uh, well, they're happy that they are with us. Okay. Well, we we also have a word that like it's it's no it's no secret that many people are not happy with the Slovak healthcare system. Uh, that even the politicians are going and have treatment in Austria. Is that true? Okay. Well, uh, I never encountered the politician, but there's a lot of artists and other people who are who are well to do who are coming and whom, whom I'm seeing. In fact, I uh, I would say that I'm seeing uh, per week like um, two, three patients from Slovakia regularly. So this happens on a regular basis. Mm. Do they do they come to get checked like out of out of point zero, or can it happen that they already took some took some diagnostic tests, uh, went to an MRI or CD scan, but they're not happy by with the consultation that they were received with their doctor and comes and come like for a second opinion to you? Well, we have yeah, second opinions happen very often, but they're not only from Slovakia, but from all other surrounding countries. I mean, we have uh, I'm seeing patients. I, I would say that uh, about fifty percent of patients that I'm seeing per week. And these are like 80 maybe or something. 50% of the patients that I'm seeing are coming from surrounding countries or not even only surrounding countries, but countries from Central and Southeastern Europe, which are not really that, 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 that near. Um, 
And very often these are second opinions. Very often these are second opinions. And we have one thing which is, I think, very important to mention in this context is that we do have the advantage of using the most modern drugs because, uh, you, you know, that there's different kinds of uh, uh, approaches in the use of modern drugs. Uh, the way is the following. The European Medicines Agency registers a drug, a drug X. This is valid for the entire European Union. So this is almost all of Europe except Switzerland and Serbia, more or less. Um, and then the decision goes to the countries which drug is being reimbursed, whether a drug is being reimbursed or not. In other words, whether the social system takes over uh, the fi financing of this, of, the, of this drug. Now, it is important to mention this context is as long as the uh, reimbursement decision has not been made, you cannot even buy the drug in the pharmacy because it's simply non-existent in this very country. So we had, for instance, uh, a major initiative from a group which, I, uh, which I'm chairing, which is called the Central European Cooperative Oncology Group, where we had um, some specialists from, uh, from Slovakia, but also from the Czech Republic and from other, from other countries. And we were analyzing what is truly going on concerning diagnostics and concerning access to drugs. And it turned out that diagnostics are not really done uh, in the molecular way, done uh, consequently uh, in Central and Southeastern Europe. But the biggest problem is the access to drugs. Mm -hmm. So um, in Austria, we have a, a, uh, an interval of three months between the registration by EMA and the decision of reimbursement by the uh, social security system. There are countries where it might take even 10 years, 10 years. Um, so we have uh, a rule of thumb. Usually we need 100 days, and in other countries and surrounding countries, it's 1,000 days, which is three years. And within these three years, you have to be aware that you're dying from something, right? If you have a, if, if you have a highly malignant disease, you're dying within these three years. So that is something which uh, sets Austria apart from a lot of countries which are, which are geographically located around it. Mm -hmm. uh your healthcare system is also specific in a way that uh, I know that you have a lot of doctors per capita. So do you think it helps the system in kind of way or is it, uh, is it in that way that uh, somebody who wouldn't pass in other countries can go to Austria and finish a doctor degree there? Uh, well, this is, um, this is quite mixed. Um, so we have in medical school, we, have, uh, we accept around 750, 800 students per year uh, and out of those a lot of them are leaving the country afterwards because a lot of Germans are coming in and they go back to Germany. A lot of Austrians uh, also go to Switzerland to, to, to work because payments are simply much better there. Uh, so um, as you say this was the case previously. Right now we're coming more and more into the problem that we're getting into a shortage of physicians. Um, and that is uh, particularly those working in social, uh, social security systems. Uh, so a lot of physicians go into private practice but don't have this kind of social security contract um, because they simply want to have time for the, for the patients. And, uh, but we are, we are not the only country. I mean, uh, there's um, very, very many countries in, the, in Western Europe which have the exactly the same problem. And Corona made the... Um, COVID made the thing even more complicated. So um, I'm uh, editing a journal for the European Society for Medical Oncology, which is the major society in Europe. We have 30,000 uh, 30, members. And there we have made a survey, which I've published in the journal, a survey of young oncologists and what their aims are during the COVID uh, crisis. And uh, to make the long story short, roughly about one third said that they would want to change their career path. And roughly one fourth said that they would want to leave medicine. So this is a major story, right? Because of course, there were a lot of attacks on people who were physicians and a lot of uh, verbal, but also physical abuse, etc. So this was a very, very difficult time. Well, and we thought that Austria was uh, uh well, we thought that this kind of stuff only happened in Slovakia, but it was happening all around well, the place. All over Europe. 
all over Europe. This was a European survey. It was not an Austrian survey. It was a European survey. So this is uh, this is a really ser serious story. And of course, you know, society is changing, and uh, being a physician is uh, maybe you know, with your night shifts, your weekends that you have to be working, your constant uh, sort of uh, availability is something which does not go very well along a work-life balance because you have more work than life, whereas people want to have very often more life than work. Yeah, uh, especially the young ones. Right. And um, Well, me too, but I, I still work. <laughs> I, I would like to, but I'm working. <laughs> uh, do you also have doctors from Slovakia? Yeah, we do. What, we do, you do. Think, what do you think of them? They are nice and well-trained. They are, you know... I always think that a lot of people who are leaving countries are the ones which are talented, which are, which are motivated, etc. So um, I'm myself born in Poland, so I know how it is to be an a immigrant, right? So um, I know exactly how it is. And it's not the ones who are passive and boring who are leaving the country, but very often the ones who have some kind of drive. And that is true for very many people. Mm. Uh, and the most important questions towards the end, like uh, just so that we understand, the people that are watching us understand, how much does a treatment at your clinic cost? Like, can you uh, say, uh, give us like some specific example? I don't know in your in your er area of expertise, or uh, I may suggest some others. That is very very difficult, and I'll tell you why. Because this depends on the drug that the patient is receiving. So, for instance, uh, there's not only this is not only what we what we charge, but we, because the, the what we charge is the lowest. The most expensive is the drug, and this depends very much on what pharma uh, pharma wants society to pay for a certain drug. So, you might you might have heard about this CAR T cell treatment? CAR T cells are um, uh, molecularly engineered uh, lymphocytes, uh, which are able to protect. Uh, to, to treat uh, malignant uh, diseases of lymph nodes after a lot of dif different treatment courses. So this can cost you up to 300,000 euros, one treatment, but you get only one treatment. So either it works or it doesn't work. Um, this, breaks into, uh, this breaks now into a series of different diseases, now, not only malignant lymphomas, but we have multiple myelomas and others, and also now moving into solid tumors. I'm only giving you this enormous example because yes. uh, that is something which that is the highest are, well say. this is the highest but there's other an antibodies for instance which cost you six thousand euros every three weeks for instance and they are available for instance in austria but not available in let's say i don't know country x in the southeast let's say okay. so these these drugs are available right now are registered for for gastric cancer is a uh, for a subtype of gastric cancer is a her2 uh a specific uh, characteristic of a certain type of gastric cancer as a specific antibody, which works beautifully, but still it is not accessible everywhere in Europe. And that, that would cost you then a couple of thousand euros. So um, the cheapest, by the way, is more and more chemotherapies because chemotherapies are rather cheap because they are mainly, there's very few chemotherapies which, are, which have been registered recently. Um, and that is, uh, and the reason is because we're moving more and more from non-specific treatment into a very personalized treatment, and chemotherapies are very rarely uh, personalized. So uh, there's a lot of generics, and, uh, and chemotherapies have become so cheap, in fact, that sometimes we don't even get the generics because it's not worth for the company to even produce the generic. Okay, but now you've talked about really when somebody has a diagnosis has some severe health problem, but what if somebody just wants to get a second opinion? Oh, like to have a chat with you yeah. for like 30 minutes or something? Yeah, well, this is uh, in the very low range of a couple of 100 euros. It's very low range. So it's, I mean, I, I, I personally, I have always the opinion that people who are uh, suffering from a disease like what I'm treating, I'm only treating patients with cancer. I cannot do anything else. Um, but I... Um, I think when you have a life-threatening disease, you should have access to a uh, to a specialist or to a highly profiled specialist of the, in, within this very area. This might be romantic or socially romantic or whatever, but I still believe that that is what it is. It should not be a privilege of rich people to survive. Well, that's the question then. Then we would have no more private clinics if everything well, would be working oh, as it should. Or 
Well, um, it depends what your what your what your thoughts are and how your thoughts are on this topic. So uh, um, let me tell you, my honorarium is the lowest point in the in when you get a, a cost estimate. Okay, uh, Professor Zelensky, uh, we have a thing in this show that you have the last word. You can say everything you anything you want to our guests here yeah. to this camera. Okay. So like you're allowed to speak to the camera like like your president. Thank you very much. Stop smoking. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.